You would gamble your safety for a mere android? Is this the human value you call friendship? Don't give me the Star Trek crap. It's too early in the morning. Well, I kind of have fun comparing and contrasting Star Trek with Red Dwarf already, so when I recently caught Clues on TV, after not having seen it in a while, I couldn't help but notice some interesting similarities to the Red Dwarf episode, Thanks for the Memory. So I thought it'd be fun to take a little break from the regular videos to talk about that. It doesn't come up very often in my videos, but I actually love Star Trek The Next Generation. My favorite main character is Data. I just kind of have a soft spot for robots with Pinocchio Syndrome. Especially when they're cute. That subject could probably be its own video, actually. I also get a huge kick out of Worf, Counselor Troy's mom, and who doesn't love Q? Not to mention how so many of Captain Picard's little characteristics have become internet memes. But that's enough about the next generation in general. I just figured I wouldn't get many chances to talk about it, plus I wanted to let you know where I'm coming from. Also, let me make it very clear that I'm not accusing Star Trek of ripping off Red Dwarf. While Clues did come out three years after Thanks for the Memory, so it's possible, especially since Patrick Stewart has mentioned that he's a Red Dwarf fan, I think two different sci-fi shows about people living in a giant ship where they explore space are bound to have other similarities. Again, this video is purely for fun, not to accuse anyone of anything. And since I have talked about Thanks for the Memory in a previous video, I'll be focusing more on Clues in this one. Clues opens up with the crew having some downtime, so they do stuff like practice Tai Chi and experiment with plants. Meanwhile, the Dwarfers are celebrating Rimmer's death day with a drunken dance party. <laughs> That's kind of how these two versions of the future differ in a nutshell. Though Picard and Guinan are on the holodeck, which I've compared to the AR games in Red Dwarf. I have an appointment with Mr. Hill at 2 o'clock. Bringing Whoopi Goldberg on this show was probably one of the best decisions they ever made. You stole his money? Don't listen to him, Gloria. He's lying. I love it when Picard does the Dixon Hill thing. So this scene doesn't have that much to do with the rest of the episode, but it sets up the idea that people, Captain Picard in particular, love a mystery. Who is this man? Who killed him? It's a mystery. Now we have to go search for clues. Guinan's not too into it, though. But he's interrupted when the bridge crew discovers an unknown planet that looks like it could support life, so they have to check it out and end up finding what appears to be a wormhole. Small and extremely unstable wormholes have been mapped near 39 T Tauri systems in the last 100 years alone, sir. Except that it ends up apparently swallowing the Enterprise, leaving everyone but Data unconscious. When they wake up, it's 30 seconds later, according to Data. Well, where the hell are we? Except that where the ship is located implies that they covered a day's worth of space. Ship status. Notice Worf back there. He's favoring his wrist, which is gonna come up later. But yeah, everything appears fine. No major damage to anyone or to the ship, except that Counselor Troy feels a little off. It'll pass. Picard remembers the planet they were going to investigate, but Data advises against going back there and suggests they launch a probe instead. Make it so. According to Data, I'm gonna be saying that a lot before things get going, the probe says basically that the planet is not habitable and has a frozen core. Riker doesn't quite buy this. It seems awfully strange that a malfunctioning sensor would give such a specific misreading of a planet. It is conceivable that the sensors picked up the afterimage of an actual planet on the other side of the wormhole. Data says that they can examine the nearby planets, but that'll take several days. Picard feels like the mystery is sufficiently solved and decides to move on. You're looking mighty suspicious, Data. By the way, you could sort of compare this to Holly's message to the Red Dwarf crew, warning them that they're not going to like what they find if they proceed. Heard what he said, knows what he's talking about, that dude. The main difference being that Holly's mind was wiped along with everyone else's. Yes, I did just compare Data to Holly. Golden Bennett. Meanwhile, Dr. Crusher is treating Chief O'Brien. Poor guy was hanging a plant when he fell and got a hurt elbow in the process. She goes to get something and notices something weird about her plant experiment where she was trying to grow a kind of alien moss. You said we were unconscious for 30 seconds? Correct. Then why do these show a full day's growth? Perhaps something extraordinary happened to one of them, but not to all of them. Picard insists that they were only out for 30 seconds, but Crusher thinks that this is possible proof that they were out for a full day. So Picard questions Data, who has kind of a weird theory about the moss that backs up his claim. That effect may have allowed Dr. Crusher's moss to arrive at the other side of the wormhole with the unanticipated growth. 
It makes sense that Data would be a better liar than Crichton since he has no emotions and therefore doesn't have anxiety about it. So, spoiler, Data is perpetually in lie mode in this episode. That said, no one actually believes Data, even though it's unusual for him to lie. Not for a second. I'm amazed he even proposed it. So they decide to check various data on the ship to see if there's any evidence of more time passing. Doctor, Commander, make it so. If there is something wrong with Data, we don't want him to be aware of our suspicions. So, among other things that are too complicated to reiterate, Geordi checked the computer's chronometer and there's a security program to prevent tampering with it, but it was disabled and replaced with another program. Someone has reset the clock. Data and I are the only ones aboard this ship capable of doing it. Well, that's a point in their favor. The Red Dwarf crew didn't even think to reset their clocks. However, they did delete the evidence of their trip to a certain moon, and Holly caught on to that, which is a little similar. And some git's been fiddling with it. Along with the missing black box, Red Dwarf is treated more like a big airplane where the Enterprise is more advanced. The closest thing to the overgrown moss is the finished puzzle in Red Dwarf. It is a mystery, Captain. Yeah, I don't make a drinking game out of every time someone says mystery in this episode. Data is questioned again, but refuses to answer this time, but consents to having his head checked. Captain's log supplemental. It has become clear that everyone aboard the Enterprise has lost an entire day. Did you look behind the fridge? If you lose something, it's nearly always there. Kind of off topic, but I like this conversation between Data and Geordi. Geordi, in a half-kidding way, uses bedside manner so Data won't be uncomfortable. You appear a bit uncomfortable yourself. It just seems like you're not being completely honest with this data. Yeah, I think Jordy is a little hurt that data is keeping something from him. I'm your friend, and if there's something wrong, I want you to tell me. I cannot tell you anything beyond what I have already stated. Or at least he's worried about what's going on with data that he needs to do that. Anyway, Jordy doesn't find anything physically wrong with data, but they start thinking he may have rigged the probe. If he rigged it, could you prove it? I could try. Then Counselor Troy gets dizzy and retires to her quarters. I can't believe those two became a couple for a while. What a random pairing that was. Worf and Dax made a lot more sense. Fight me. Anyway, she looks in the mirror and has a freak out. It seemed a stranger was staring back at me from behind my own eyes. As if my face was a mask. Okay, that's creepy. Sometime later, Data is being questioned again. Apparently, he pulled up an image of a planet from their archives. I cannot verify that hypothesis, but you don't deny it. No, sir. Geordi is told to send another probe. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, Data. It sucks to be Geordi in this episode. Picard tells Data what happened to Counselor Troy and asks if it's linked to the missing 24 hours. No, sir, I cannot. Picard demands to know why Data has been hindering his every attempt to find out what's going on. Would you rather endanger Deanna, a friend and colleague, than tell me what is going on? Which would you place first? The welfare of a single individual, or that of the entire crew? So you're saying that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few? As if fans weren't already comparing Data to Spock. Picard orders Data to tell him what actually happened. Whatever it is that Data is hiding, he's willing to put his career... Do you also realize that you would most likely be stripped down to your wires to find out what the hell has gone wrong? and possibly his life on the line for it. Meanwhile, Worf is experiencing some wrist pain, so he goes to see Dr. Crusher. I love how he obviously doesn't want to be there. Perhaps not. That's so cute. A warrior does not complain about physical discomfort. And the fact that he'd hate being called cute just makes it cuter. It turns out that his wrist was broken, reset, and treated during the missing time. Kind of like how Lister and Cat each have a broken foot. Obviously, Red Dwarf medical technology isn't as advanced, since they have to wear casts. Which have signatures on them, I just noticed. Worf is like, I didn't get hurt, shut up. This indicates that not only did the lost 24 hours happen, but they were all conscious of it at the time and apparently had their memories wiped afterwards. There are very few individuals on board who could have broken my wrist. Commander Data is one of those individuals. He's actually hilariously wrong about that, and I can't wait until I get to that scene. But I'm beginning to suspect that Commander Data is refusing to cooperate, because he believes that he is acting in the best interests of the Enterprise. Anyway, the probe comes back with the same information they got on the planet before they encountered the wormhole, except that now there are no traces of a wormhole. That's because there is no wormhole. 
I never was. It's a ruse designed to throw us off the track. Picard has realized that there must have been a struggle during that time that they don't remember. The fact that we're still alive suggests we might have won. Data's behavior would seem to suggest that we did not. Maybe a compromise was reached, a compromise that forced Data into this silence. They come to the conclusion that there was probably a good reason why their memories were wiped, and Picard is prepared to let it go. Some things are best left buried. But he needs to find out what Data's role was in this. Anson, take us back to the scene of the crime. I love his choice of words there, he's channeling Dixon Hill a little. So they put up the shields and get ready for some kind of possible attack. They are approached by an energy pulse which appears to go into Counselor Troy. Who approaches Data, apparently possessed. The plan has failed. I think it's sort of amusing that it had her get dressed first since she was asleep and in her nightgown before. Also, it had her put makeup on. I have to look my best when I destroy the ship. Your ship is again in our space. Aliens! <laughs> yeah, this time it is aliens. Ever knows that they never used that word on Star Trek? It makes sense. If you live and work in space with people from other planets, you wouldn't want to use a word like aliens. It would be dehumanizing, for lack of a better word. So yeah, this is the being that had some kind of deal going on with Data, where he wasn't supposed to tell anyone what happened. The Enterprise is not a threat to you. Give me more time. Our destruction would only- And yeah, apparently everyone on the ship is in danger. Do nothing. It may yet be possible to salvage the situation. Anyway, Data is called to the bridge, and he says that they must leave immediately. Why? Any further delay would put us all at grave risk. Why are you compelled to disobey my orders during the missing day? Were you contacted by Starfleet? Did they order you to conceal the truth from us? That's an interesting conspiracy theory, but the truth is a lot more interesting. Now, who gave you that order? You did, sir. I ordered you to lie. Meanwhile, there's an energy field that is trying to take over the ship. We must bury shield shape and strength as rapidly as possible. Maximum shields will only speed the ship's takeover. It turns out that the planet is inhabited by the Paxons, who... They are xenophobes, sir. Isolationists. Basically just want to be left alone. The wormhole is a trap to keep out invaders. It basically stuns everyone on board the ship and pushes the ship away. So the crew wakes up and thinks they've been through a wormhole, they count their blessings and keep going. Precisely. Unfortunately, the stunning doesn't work on Data. He remained conscious while we tried to take over the ship. When I realized the crew was incapacitated, I initiated emergency procedures. So not unlike in Thanks for the Memory, here's the recounting of what really happened. Data revived the crew while the ship was stuck in a field that was acting as a tractor beam. That's when they took possession of Counselor Troy so they could communicate. Captain! Here we go. Yep, Worf just got warfed by Counselor Troy. Granted, being possessed by the Paxons probably made her super strong or something, but it just looks so funny out of context. You are aware of our existence. We have no choice but to destroy this ship. If you destroy this ship, then others will come in search of us. Knowledge of your civilization will be spread across half the galaxy. I love how Captain Picard doesn't try to impose any kind of human morals on them. Like, killing us would be unethical. He's just like, this isn't going to solve your problem. He promises to never reveal their existence, but that's kind of hollow. There are over 1,000 life forms on this vessel. How could you assure their silence? I will ask them nicely. Picard asks if the Paxons have the ability to erase the crew's memories of the encounter. They do, but it'll take a day. I am ordering you never to reveal what has happened here today. Not to Starfleet, not to myself even. And of course, he also ordered everyone to hide any traces of what happened. Let's get to work. Yeah, we saw how well that worked. Basically, they didn't do a good enough job, obviously. So Picard asks for another chance. Clues were left behind that suggested a mystery. And to many humans, a mystery is irresistible. Consider... The first time, uh, a run-through, a rehearsal, to shake out the flaws. You are a most unusual species, worthy of a second chance. Second chance granted. And this time, let's get it right. So they wake up again, Data says they were out for 30 seconds, and most of the dialogue is about the same as the first time. There's still that anomalous Class M planet we were going to investigate. 
Henson, we've brought a course to take Sir, us back to... The... it is likely the anomalous readings were the result of the wormhole's effect. So they send out another probe and move on. Make it so. And put out a hazard advisory to Starfleet. And I guess this means it worked this time, though we don't really know what they did differently. Engage. Other than apparently covering their tracks better. I guess if I wanted to be picky, I could complain about that, but eh. I'm not gonna pit the episodes against each other as far as which one was better because it's a little too much apples and oranges. If nothing else, Red Dwarf was only in its second season where where The Next Generation was in its fourth. And like I'm always saying, since Red Dwarf is a comedy, it can get away with a lot more where The Next Generation deserves a little more scrutiny. I do like how the big bad of Clues is just a race of people who wanted to be left alone. Granted, they were ready to destroy the ship if things didn't work out, but I kind of get a kick out of the simplicity of that whole concept. Still on a much bigger scale than Thanks for the Memories, which was all about Lister making the mistake of secretly giving Rimmer some false memories of a previous relationship of his. You should have bought him a tie. Then when Rimmer catches on, it results in disaster and heartbreak. I don't want to feel like this anymore. So they end up burying the ship's black box on a moon with a headstone to commemorate their memories of this woman as a weird way to put closure on it. Lister and Kat each dropping the headstone on their foot, and then everyone having their memories from the last four days erased. Come to think of it, why didn't it occur to them that waking up with casts on their legs would clue them in that something happened? Eh, rule of funny. Clues is a pretty solid episode overall, and I like how it plays on our desire to solve mysteries and how the opening with the Dixon Hill bit kind of foreshadows that. But I do have to give thanks for the memory credit for having the scene where Rimmer gets drunk, confesses that he's only ever had sex one time, and in general just gets way too honest, and we end up with what is probably the first instance of Rimmer being a sympathetic character. I'd trade everything in to be loved and to have been loved. I just realized Rimmer is the anti-Riker. Or is Riker the anti-Rimmer? But yeah, there's nothing like that in Clues. The closest we get is the scene with Geordi and Data, which definitely has heart to it, but it doesn't really compare. We already know that Geordi and Data are besties, and it's not really surprising to find out that Geordi is worried about Data when something seems to be wrong with him, where moments where we sympathize with Rimmer are few and far between. Also, not enough giant inflatable bananas, zero out of 10. Nah, both episodes are great in their own way. And I guess that's about all I have to say in regards to how Clues compares and contrasts with Thanks for the Memory. This is the first video like this I've done, so let me know what you thought of it and if you'd like to see more. If there are more episodes from both shows that are similar to each other. How about Fistful of Datas versus Gunmen of the Apocalypse? Next up, when I get back to Red Dwarf episodes, which should be soon, is Season 12 with Cured. See you then. I've had enough fun for today.